Greetings citizens of YouTube, welcome to another YouTube video. This time we're chronicling the final eight match of my Player of the Year tournament. I will be taking on Jaycon from Team Perion. This was, I think, our first ever tournament meeting, if I'm not mistaken. Anyways, I'm going to go in and we're going to dive in and look at the deck list for Jaycon. If you want to know the deck list that I'm playing, this is a locked deck list format, best three of five ban one god so your opponent chooses the three decks they need to win with if you want to look at my deck list look at my round of 16 video with fate i think it's just a waste of time for me to go over the exact same list my list can't change it's locked once the tournament entry start so i'm gonna go over jay Con's list they're actually very similar to mine and then we will go ahead and get into the match so here are Jay Khan's list. I'm actually not going to spend too much time on them because they're very similar to my list. This is a Hidden Rush Deception deck. They've run Reflection Elementalist and Lethal Prowler, two kind of niche picks. Everything else is somewhat standard. I don't run the Encumbered Looters, but a lot of early game hidden minions. You want to have the big burst with the Dark Knives, Assassin's Aim. And for the memes, he even put in a Heads or Tails. So we'll see if that ever comes into a play. And he does run the Umber Arrow package, which I do not run. Classic Hidden Rush Deception. I'm also playing a Hidden Rush Deception variant as well. He's playing Zoo Light, and I'm also playing a Zoo Light variant. I would say this is pretty standard. He does run one Martyr and is running two Extortionist. I am running none of those cards, but they're only running one Vesper. And I'm running some other tech as well in my list. So, again, this is just standard aggro zoo light stuff. Nothing that is too shocking. And here they're playing a very standard version of card draw magic as well. Keep in mind that in round number one, this was the deck I farmed. Fate came out with a card draw magic deck. I lost the two games that were not against card draw magic. And I farmed card draw magic in all three of my wins. So coming into this match, I was hoping to duplicate that type of success in this matchup. His list, very similar to Fate's, a very standard book list. And I'm also playing a card draw magic list. However, I run Demogorgons and Therial to give my deck a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more of a control vibe. It's a different style, but this these are the two minor differences. Again, card draw magic, been meta for a, for a while very standard and everyone's favorite deck last but not least he has his war deck normally i would talk about this but i i'm sick of looking at control war decks i'm so sick of looking at control war decks i banned it i banned the control war deck he actually got me a little bit by surprise on the demand i thought uh, on the ban i thought he would ban either hidden rush or a uh, war and he ended up banning my light deck so i will have to validate deception magic and war he will have to validate deception light and magic and let's go ahead and dive straight in to game number one here we are game number one queuing magic into magic both a card draw magic this is a mirror we're going second which not ideal but in this matchup it isn't the you know be all end all like for instance if you're facing aggro light with another aggro deck then it's it's really bad or if you're playing the hidden rush mirror that's also really really bad this matchup is certainly winnable here in the mulligan phase trying to get to my palace wand that would be the dream card we like the card draw here but don't want two frenetic bibliomaniacs you could argue that i should have kept the rune moth over the layward hatchling and that does help a little bit with the mulligan phase so slight thing that we could have done different in the mulligan but this is not really bad of course j Con coming out here with an early shadow scryer is coming out with a much better open than what we had uh, we're turn two pipping out the bibliomaniac but really a slow start and you don't like falling behind super early in this matchup because what j Con's gonna get here is he's gonna get chip damage and he's gonna get favor and neither of those things do we want him to have especially in a mirror where the game is usually going to come down to flinging stuff at their face. So, here they just keep keep on drawing cards here. And our, our hand isn't the best. 
We do have a tracking bolt, which may or may not get some value here. He doesn't want to trade. He wants to go face to deal damage to my face and accumulate favor. We have the Street Conjurer, which often combos very nicely with the Tracking Bolt. However, with his board, it doesn't really do anything. I mean, we could use it to boost up to kill the Street Conjurer when we Tracking Bolt. But we would also basically be giving up ours. So not a really good ideal board state. Pretty rough start to this one. Basically, the dream start for J-Con in this matchup and the nightmare for me. We're just going second having a little bit of a clunky draw. He has a lot of early game minions and really applying the pressure and asking some questions to us early in the game. We get the Palace Wand, of course, a little bit late. I mean, we passed on one and then had had very slow kind of turn two ideas. So not, not generally the idea of what we want here. Jaycon's going to be able to get the first pick of anything he wants from the Sanctum. For personally for me the vow of champions is the best card in the sanctum and he might end up picking the ranger first bow here which i would probably disagree with but he goes ahead attacks with the street conjurer but this leaves everything on the board with one health and here i do something a little bit controversial you hate giving up the pure knowledge on a board like this and effectively start milling yourself but I, I, I think that it's just necessary. I just can't take five and give him 15 favor. That's just a bad formula. So we use the Pyrrhic Knowledge desperately and defensively early. Again, it's a great start for Jaycon here that we're kind of having to take this desperate line at this stage. The good news is we have the Palace Wand going and we buy from the Sanctum on this turn, even though we know our opponent's not going to get the favor. So we cost reduction to Lay Horde. And we know there's a lot of lines where we, we, we might play Lay Horde next turn. For instance, we could consider a Lay Horde and Ranger First Bow next turn. Or Ranger First Bow plus Kalurus Rune Moth. And meanwhile, Jaycon's going to continue chipping away at our face. He's gotten six points of free chip damage. I call it free chip damage because he hasn't used any of his direct damage spells that would normally be directed at my face. He's just attacked with minions on the board and all of that is just like extra. And that's always something you would really like to achieve in the card draw magic mirror. And I have not been able to establish any sort of board presence whatsoever in this game yet. So here I play the ranger first bow in, in, in the rune moth. The rune moth is almost never living here and i said that last time in the card draw magic mirror when i faced fate and somehow it lived for four turns so we we put it out here i don't have high expectations and he's gonna play some spell boost here and i i know that that rune moth is probably going away the question is is it going to be form of power or is it going to be ancient text and he answers the question right there with the ancient text to remove the rune moth which is a, a bit rough a bit rough indeed. And we're, we're still trying to eke and claw our way back into this game. And yeah, they've got a, a more minion presence. And I don't want to be absorbing points of damage from the minions. And we top deck the Street Conjurer. And this does give us some options. We can play the Street Conjurer, use the Tracking Bolt, and potentially get a little bit of board presence. We can't actually wipe his board here. But instead, we're going to play the Blade of the White playing for some more card draw here and draw into the Unbound Flames. And we've got a lot of cards in hand. And the, the question is, is, do we play the Rune of Life now or not? I actually think I misplayed that turn. I should have played the Street Conjurer, the Tracking Bolt, used the Rune of Life on the Street Conjurer, and the GP would have led to a full board clear. And we could have saved the Blade of the White playing for the following turn. This line's okay. But our opponent is going to achieve one extra point of chip damage. And at the end of the game, they're going to try to burn us out. Here, I remember that I played Pyrrhic Knowledge and I forgot to look at what I lost in the Void. So I go back and I lost the Blade of the White Plane and Shadow Scryer. Honestly, I'm happy. I'm happy that I only lost that. Could have been a lot worse. He gets out the Oni Spell Sword, and the Oni Spell Sword is certainly going to ask questions. That is what we call in the biz a must remove minion. We have to kill the Oni Spell Sword. We have no other alternatives in this situation. 
We get Therial, and Therial can be a very, very useful card, though we need to really clear out some space from our hand. Therial doesn't really combo very well with Palace Wand, which is kind of awkward because Palace Wand is one of the key cards in this deck, which is why some people would consider what I'm doing a questionable deck decision by running Therial in this matchup. Here, I do another questionable thing and, and drop the Layhorde Hatchling with the idea that I don't want him to achieve any more chip damage, but I'm leaving the spell boost on the board. It just feels like he's going to be able to go towards my face here and potentially just keep pressuring me. And it's just really hard to find a spot for Therial. We really need to dump our hand pretty quickly. Though next turn, we can definitely play one of our Unbound Flames if we would like. I really need to remove the spell boost minion because I know that Jaycon's very likely to punish me. He's got the palace wand going, so he's got his card draw mechanics in. He's probably got a handful of cards that want to go to the face here. Uh, at this point, I'm taking a peek, sees at his void, wondering what type of direct damage spell to the face stuff Jaycon has remaining. And the answer to that question is just about everything. He's got he's got almost everything here. We draw the Shadow Scryer, which honestly, it looks like a bad draw, but the way I look at it is it's very easy to get out of my hand, and I want to set up the Therial, because if I can get the Therial and get some healing going on here, then that's pretty good. And the cool thing about drawing the Shadow Scryer this turn is when I play the Layhorde Hatchling and I play the Shadow Scryer, then I'm setting up space in my hand for Therial, which I can then play next turn even. Our opponent's at 30, we have achieved zero chip damage, we have played two of our Lakeward Hatchlings, which I normally want to fling directly at his face, and this is this is a difficult spot. So here I take, I take a panic there, and I use the Palace Wand. This was a play mistake on my part, because I'm going to overdraw when I play Therial, and I realize this like right after I do it. It's just a careless play mistake. Also, he could, in theory, peel a couple of minions and then buy the Nightleaf and then kill my Palace Wand. I'm less worried about that exact scenario. But as soon as I use the Palace Wand, I kind of realize, uh-oh, I, I messed up. I messed up indeed. And I guess it's really hard to peel the Shadow Scryer this turn. So that's, that's one thing. He's probably not going to get the favor of this turn. Could easily get it next turn. And I'm aiming toward playing Therial which leaves my palace wand kind of naked. He's going face with the worm breath, which isn't a, uh, isn't a big surprise. He wanted to get that another activation on the palace wand. Here, I have the option to buy the nightly trapper to take out his palace wand. Here, I look at the snow shaper palace and I'm like, you know, if I play Therial, I overdraw Snow Shaper Palace, and Snow Shaper Palace is kind of a useless card. Here, I make a play mistake. I slap down the Therial. I should have bought the Nightleaf Trapper first and then use my pip to play the Therial, that would have gotten rid of his Palace Wand. So I'm really taking some imprecise lines here, but right off the bat we get Heal Your God for 7. That is the exact card we wanted to get. And then we get the Goblets here, and then we get another Heal for 7. So got getting the two Heal for 7s off the Therial, this could be the key moment that really turns the game around. We know the top card of our deck is Snow Shaper Palace, and we're fine with overdrawing that card. And here... Jaycon is is in a, in a little bit of a bind. We've got the Therial on the board. We've got a lot of heal in our hand. Uh, I think it's going to be very hard to deal 19 from hand this turn, though I could be incorrect. So we're, we're posing a little bit of a question to Jaycon here, who now is probably debating on whether or not he wants to peel the Therial or whether or not he wants to continue throwing things at our face. By continue throwing things at our face, he's asking the question, what did you get from Therial? Of, of which I was very successful on my Therial. I got two Heal Your Gods for seven, and those are very, very strong at this point of the game. So he goes face with the Warm Breath, which is definitely something he could have had, and face with the... Lay Horde, which gets us down to 10, so we're already very, very low. And Pyrek going to get another bursty burst here, going to get the Worm Breath. And here we go all the way down to 5, so he did tons of damage that turn. 
milled some cards. We lose the Snowshaper Palace. The top card of our deck is Pure Acknowledge, which we decide to keep here. Here, I make another play mistake. I, I, I take a long think here, and I'm like, can he kill me? Can he kill me? And I make a play mistake because I think that after, after analyzing the situation after the game, there was some outs here. So I have to decide whether or not I want to kind of speed the game up by playing Goblets and then trading and going face, or do I want to just heal and go to 19? I should just play the other Curator and heal and go to 19. Here I make a mistake and play the Goblets, which could potentially give Jaycon some outs here, which I, I didn't think that he would have 12 points of lethal, uh, uh, of extra burn after playing what he played last turn. But this is a little bit tighter than, than we would like. I'm going to play the Street Conjurer to get a little bit of board presence here. We are basically threatening lethal next turn because we know we've got pure knowledge. And we know if our, our minions live, obviously, it is, it is lethal. So we're asking the question to Jaycon here. I think a slower approach with the Curor would have been very smart. He's going to be able to apply some spell boost here and play some spells... And I'm at 12, a very vulnerable number. 19 would have felt a lot better. Keep in mind, this deck, the deck I'm playing, has two Demogorgons, which we haven't drawn either. So we could, in theory, just kind of heal out of range of our opponent, which would have been a good strategy to take. Jaycon, go into the rope here, trying to find the lethal in this situation. Can he find the lethal? He's got the spell boost. He's got the form of power. That's two points of damage to the face. Can he burst for 10? The Unbound Flames. If he's got a cost reduction pirate knowledge, he gets there. But he empowers the Unbound Flames. A sigh of relief for me that my questionable line, questionable play mistake didn't cost me. Theriel did indeed save the game. And here, we simply have lethal. We can go face with our two minions, the Street Conjurer, the Worm Breath, and the Pyrrhic Knowledge. Get us over the line and will let us take game number one. Very tight game. I don't think I played this particularly amazing. Now, one thing I will point out is I fell behind early. I did keep myself cool, calm, and collected. Did get myself back into the game. Therial, the interesting gamble deck decision, paid off dividends and basically stole the game. Without Therial, I do not win the game. We win game number one, and now let's head into game number two. So here we come back into game number two. I'm playing Aggro War. He's playing Aggro Zulite, and he is going first. You hate facing Zulite going second, especially if you're also an Aggro player. But here we get a very good-looking opening hand, very reactive. We've got the Goblet's Imp, which is probably the best card I can have in this situation for a defensive standpoint. Surprising the chat here, but the Imp is a 2-mana 3-3, three, three, plays very good defensively. Our health total isn't very important in this matchup. It's all about seizing control of the board early. We've got two Blitz minions that we can play very early in this game, and Valka's Captain can get us a Relic. So I really like my opening hand here. And he goes ahead and plays a 1-1. One, one. We have the option of what we want to do this turn. I think the Pyramid Warden is a mistake because of the potential for Extortionist. So I go ahead and lead with the Tavern Brawler because I'm guaranteeing that, hey, I'm chipping away already. He's got a Pyramid Warden and honestly, that's the last thing I wanted to see because we don't go cleanly into that at all. I go ahead and decide to put my Tavern Brawler in the void, but I'm very well aware if he's got Extortionist, he already just basically takes control, full control of this game moving forward. He's got Martyr of the White Plane, which is not a super great card to have. We can get back the Tavern Brawler and have a really, really good turn. And this is a key moment here. We can play the Scythe, which puts the Pyramid Warden out of range of any levy possibilities, which is just key. I'm guaranteed to get back the Tavern Brawler, which is absolutely huge. And then I can just remove the Martyr and then remove the... 1-1. Uh, one, one. Now, here I make a play mistake. I should go face, because the Martyr comes back, but in, in the, I make a mistake, because this is an open deckless format. He's got Canonize in his deck. If I go face, I'm not vulnerable to Canonize, but I elect to trade, which sets myself up to get wrecked by Canonize, or, well, he just plays Blade of the White Plane. 
There's there's multiple ways to deal with that situation. He gets back Pyramid Warden, which was actually only a 50-50 because I attacked. Because I made a mistake, it was only a 50-50. I still think that was a mistake, by the way. But he gets, he gets back the Pyramid Warden, and we have to play the Woodcutter Imp here. No option. We're going to get back something from the vo Void, something back from the Casino here. And we get back what? We get back Pyramid Warden. Actually, wait a minute. I take back what I said earlier. He was not, he was guaranteed to get back Pyramid Warden for, from the Blade of the White Plane play because it's the only minion in his Void. The 1-1 one, one with Protected went right back to his hand because of the Martyr. Anyways, we have a very good looking board now. They've got a lot of cards in hand though. So <laughs> we're trying to do everything we can being reactive, playing second as Agro War, and we're fighting hard here. But it's, it's just getting that Pyramid Warden back and then getting another Pyramid Warden back. The Pyramid Scheme is not working out in my favor at all here. And they get to draw from the Martyr. Very critical turn for them. Since they were able to remove the Pyramid Warden, that's really, really putting me in quite a bind. The, the Vexing Thought Car isn't super effective, but that extra one health on the lad is an extra headache for myself. So I have to decide what I want to do this turn, and I don't have many good options here. There are some Sanctum plays, and I do have one, dur one, one Strength on my Relic here. Here, I like to play the Scythe. The, which might have been a little bit inaccurate because we do lose the one attack with the relic, but I feel felt like I'm getting a little bit more defensive on the board here, and then unfortunately we get back the pyramid warden, which is just an absolute headache from my perspective because I just feel like I know that he's going to get value from it. We go ahead and attack, which buffs our pyramid warden. And by the Nightleaf Trapper, it protects our Relic and gains a little bit of board presence from our perspective. So we know they can kill the Pyramid Warden very, very easily by running the Vanguard Axe Woman and the Blade of the White Plane into the minion. And they might get another Pyramid Warden back, which would just be absolutely absurd. He's gotten it back twice. Can he get can, can he get back a third time? It's is how many times can that pyramid warden beat us? Basically, now he gets a five wide board and plays radiant dawn and yeah, that's not what I wanted to see. That is very very effective. Getting the two attacks in, asking the question, why is he getting back from the void? You guessed it, pyramid warden once more. This is not what we wanted to see. He's ahead on the board state, ahead on cards and cards in hand ahead on uh health he's ahead in literally every aspect of this gods unchained match the realistic ways for me to come back in this game are very slim as i think about the situation we draw the master tactician which doesn't do much in this situation if i'm being completely blunt but here I have the option to attack with the Valkyrie into the Pyramid Warden. But I know that I'm going to uh, trade with a 2-2 two -two on their side anyways. So I'm hoping to peel a Goblet's Imp so I can full clear the board. It is in my void. And I love dealing damage to myself. But we get another Pyramid Warden. Which I just feel like he can just completely abuse and get himself like his 10th Pyramid Warden in this game. Absolutely absurd. So this game has been an entire Pyramid Scheme. Here I'm debating on whether or not I want to go face or not. Do I, do I want to play, go face and play the Volcus Captain, or do I just want to play these two minions? And, and the idea behind playing the Volcus Captain this turn is if he attacks into my Pyramid Warden, his Drider goes down to one health, which I can th indeed finish off with my one attack Relic. Though, they've got four cards in hand, and it just feels like I'm going to get punished for something here. And they do have the Extortionist indeed by the front line from the Sanctum, no surprise, that's always an appealing pick when you're facing a war deck. And they're able to go ahead and chip away at my Pyramid Warden. The Battle Bard, unfortunately for me, doesn't really accomplish much. Our opponent is at 30. And it, it, we're at 6 mana and our opponent's at 30 playing Aggro War. That's a sign that something did not work out the way we wanted it to work out. Here, I pick up the Vicious Adventurer. He's got a lot of small minions on the board. And I'm kind of desperate for cards here. So we are just going to flood the board here, playing defensively, not letting him go wide. We're worried about a lot of wide buffs 
that can really expose our situation and just desperate to get any any sort of board presence whatsoever and we finally reached the scoreboard by hitting the skill button we were on the board we got him to 28 i feel like i should get a medal a participation medal of some sort for accomplishing this it's just been a rough go of it so far in this game he's got yet another pyramid warden i'm sick of seeing that card and a radiant dawn to go alongside it which kind of justifies my decision of of, of denying his his ability to get an even wider board presence but then he gets another pyramid warden and you know the whole pyramid warden thing is what cost me the game if i didn't play pyramid warden this game i think i have a chance but man those pyramid wardens just absolutely completely wrecked me i have realistically no way back at, in, in this game I have, aside from disconnection, I don't think there is a possible way for me to win this game. He's going to play Fester, and I don't run Soul Survivor, spoiler alert, and even if I did, he could actually still handle the situation by making trade first. But he elects to just buy the Rune of Fire, and he's going to remove my last minion, so even if I hypothetically had Soul Survivor, which is not in my deck, I have no way forward here. Here I simply pass turn not going to waste anybody's time here we know the inevitable is going to be lethal here and jay con's going to take game number two and tie up the series at one one game apiece honestly i think i played very well in that game there's just sometimes there's just nothing you can do and there was nothing i could do i actually played better in that game than i played in game number one but it is what it is so now we queue into game number three. This match is tied up one apiece. We queue with our Hidden Rush. He's playing Card Draw Magic, and we're going second for the third game in a row. Two Dark Knives. Dark Knives aren't particularly great in this matchup, and you see the two Dark Knives and the Cat, and I run away from that as fast as possible. Here, I make a very questionable decision. Probably should toss the Knives, just gets Tracking Bolted too often here. And But you get two for one, and in this matchup, it's not great to, to go necessarily go all in like that. We unfortunately draw Assassin's Zane, which is a really bad card to draw here. But the makeshift Shiv is great into the Shadow Scryer, so that's why we kept the Shiv, knowing that Shadow Scryer is a very likely early open for him. Now we get out the Cat, and the Cat is, is, is pretty effective. And we have the Knife, so we're probably going to ask the question. And when we ask the question, it, it, a lot of times it's, it, it's, you know, they have it, they have it. If they don't, they don't. So the card they need is tracking bolt here. They play room off and here I make the biggest mistake that I make in the entire match. And I have to kill the room off. That is very, very clear here. I just go face instinctively with the cat and racing the situation. The dude's at 25 after I attack, I could have used my God power to, I could have used my pip to Orpheo's Distraction, the 1-3, which would allow my cat to hit the room off and kill the room off. Absolutely horrendous play mistake from my end. I'm basically asking the question whether or not he has Tracking Bolt and just going to flat out race. I did have a bad turn two there because I had no two drops from hand, but using the GP on Warp Engineer to get rid of the room off was a solid line anyways. It turns out he had the Tracking Bolt. So I was kind of at a disadvantage position anyways, but now he's in a situation where he's got a room off that's generating cards a turn. So I could have killed it there and he would have still had the ruin in hand and still would have had the tracking bolt in hand. Those two things would have stayed the same. So we would have been in a bad spot anyways, but now he's going to get additional value from the room off. And the more the room off lives, the more it snowballs. So a minimum of two turns of just pure outright value for Jaycon here he gets the gets the martyr which the martyr is super awkward because what do i really do here now I'm, i've got to think you know what are my chances of winning here how how do i orchestrate a victory of any sorts here and he's got a relatively wide board stance going right now purchases the card shark which can indeed and will often indeed ask some sort of questions and we do take some mana you know hit here and here i make another play mistake why stone skin i have to just kill the room off and 
at this stage, I'll be honest, we're, we are so far behind in this game that there probably is no coming back. But here, I, I made a miscalculation because I thought I could play Assassin Zame and GP and I could go face and race, which I'm honestly not winning that face race anyways. But this game is just an atrocious mess. Really, how how to not play against a room off is how I would title this game. I'm going to be blunt. I don't think any of this will matter. And you can probably get a feel of the result of this game from the doom and gloom from my tone. At this point, there just really isn't much of a way to potentially come back and win this the hope is that I could get like a big burst turn and then like a Merrick or something. But instead, they're going to get a Rune of Strength and add even more front lines to the situation. And what do I have here? But really just no way to win the game. Surprise delivery, completely useless. We're still eating our own mana here. At the end of the day, this was a horrendously played game by myself. But I, I don't think it, it ended up mattering. But you, you still got to make the correct correct plays, and then, and then who knows? Very winnable matchup if, if we play this correctly. And unfortunately for us, there's just nothing we can do. I mean, we, we kill the Martyr, but at the, at the end of the day, they're going to go straight to the face here, and they have lethal here like 10 times out of 10 here. It's just the, the Rune Moth get an absolute insane value. Actually, kind of a throwback to my matchup with Fate when the Rune Moth lived for four turns. The Rune Moth solos us in this game, and Jaycon takes a 2-1 to one lead in the match. So our backs up are, are up against the wall. We're down 2-1. to one. We must win this game, and for the first time all match, we get the first turn advantage with an aggro v aggro matchup, which is exactly what we want. The imp is somewhat questionable of a keep in this matchup because they're kind of racing. And with the, all their hidden stuff, it's less effective. So blitz is less effective against hit and rush because you often have very little to run into. Here, I'm thinking that, well, I can play two one drops on turn one and really get some pressure. And then I'm inconsistent and don't play the axe one on one. Uh, looking back on it, I don't like the mulligan keep there. I think I should play the Axe Woman on one if I'm going to keep it. But now I look like a genius because they open Armor Lurker, so there you go. Here we get a little bit of pressure out, out there, which is, is what we want to accomplish. And he's got the Armor Lurker, which can go into the min minion, but we do have the Relic, which can finish off the Armor Lurker. Here he either has a horrendous hand or takes, takes a really bad line here. You never you never do that. And then he pips out the makeshift shiv and goes face. So I, I just generally don't like hiding armor lurkers. It's just a bad line. It's not a winning line here. We know that they're t going passive and going value-oriented. So we're going straight to the face. We're going to race you. We're going to make this a foot race and see if you can win the foot race against us. And when you're playing very passively with those armor lurkers, generally you don't win the race. Even though the Goblet's Imp just kind of ends the game sooner, it doesn't contribute too much to the race from, from our perspective. So here, um, Jaycon is playing very defensively with Hidden Rush. Now gets out the Shade Walker, uses the pip, uh, but we are still ahead in the race, and that's what matters here. We can get out the Bladed Sticks, we get out the Valkyrie, we've got the Slaymaster Valka coming out next turn, really posing the question here. Lots of damage now. Interesting interesting note here, we don't buy from the Sanctum here. There's a lot of juicy things in the Sanctum, but we leave it. The reason why we leave it is so we can play Slaymaster Valka with the Blitz next turn. And if they play anything that's not hidden, Slaymaster Valka comes in and it's Christmas day for fake muse it's just it's just a beautiful gift and right now it's a very difficult situation for our opponent we're actually threatening lethal so he has to play defense here and if he plays defense here he probably leaves himself exposed to slay master valka very tough spot for jaycon here and this is his turn four this is his turn four we could easily have lethal on turn five depending on what he does here he doesn't have time to go all in on the Shade Walker, which is definitely something that he would want to do. We see him go to the rope here, 
and it's just really because he doesn't have a play that he wants to do. I can tell you what he's thinking. He's sitting there disgusted and playing defense and leaving the Shade Walker there on the board, which is just not idea. They get another Shade Walker to come down on the battlefield. And here we draw the battle bard, and here it's time to do a little bit of mathematics. We can just slap down the Slay Master Volca if we want. But if we play the Battle Bard, 3, 6, 9, the Rune of Strength or the Vow of Champions is lethal. And I'm debating on the two cards. A very important debate here. For some reason, I'm going to spend more on this decision than any decision in the match. A good player would think think think, think this through. I'm double counting to make sure my math is correct. I think I have lethal here. I mean, I, I do have lethal here. But, you know, fake news at this time didn't realize the, realize the situation. Very, very easy. Everything goes to the face here. And ultimately, there isn't anything that J-Con's going to be able to do here. We will force game number five, our third straight win with our backs up against the wall, facing elimination, a do or die game. Game five coming up next. So here we are. It's game number five, do or die. We're both playing Hidden Rush Deception. Unfortunately, I'm going second. You hate to see going second in this matchup. Stoneskin's a really bad card. And I should have honestly tossed the Stone Skin before I tossed the Avatar of Deception, Order of Operations, minor thing. But here we have a very bad opening hand, I would say. But they get the Switch Duels out there, and hey, I can I can play value with the Armor Lurker, and we're loving the Armor Lurker on one. We just need a two. So we draw the Arms Dealer, which is a terrible card to draw, but we need something to go along next turn. We're playing kind of tempo-oriented here. And they go ahead, play the other, the other armor lurker, and we get an arms dealer. Oh, this is so painful. Three four drops in hand, and it is just absolutely atrocious. We could pip hide our armor lurker, but then they don't even have to attack with their armor lurker. They could play a hidden, hidden minion and pass. Instead, they go face, and they play Avatar of Deception, which is a really, really tough card for us to deal with. We can play the Pyramid Warden, which slows them down mildly. We've got the Feral Shapeshifter. If we had the Pyramid Warden last turn, we could have played the Feral Shapeshifter or the Arms Dealer. We could have done a lot of different things, but this is not great. You could argue playing the Feral Shapeshifter was better there because we leave ourselves with a, with a, a potential top deck option of being able to put, put together the Pyramid Warden with something else next turn. But they do what I expected them to do, which means we can play the Feral Shapeshifter and attack with the Makeshift Shift to kill the Switch Duelist next, to kill the, um, to kill the Avatar of Deception. So this worked out as we were hoping it would kind of work out here, and we were going to have the option, the first option in the Sanctum, to buy the Rune of Strength, clear best card in the Sanctum. But they can already go face for eight. And any type of Assassin's Aim, Dark Knives, any type of burst they have here, and we're in a lot of trouble. And we're just hoping that they flat out don't have it. They can just go face for eight and we're really, ask, really asking questions, but they have it. They have the Assassin's Aim, which honestly is the best card in the entire deck they could have here. They go face once more. And now here, unless we top deck some front line, we're just absolutely fried. So we've only got one out in our deck, which is Pyramid Warden, or high rolling on the Dedicant to potentially get the Battle Oryx. We do draw the Pyramid Warden, which was the only out we had for survival. But this is a tough spot. The question is, is do we go face and try to race and just assume that the Pyramid Warden is too much? Or do we remove the Switch Duelist because we think that they might be able to kill the Pyramid Warden? If they kill the Pyramid Warden, their god power can, can kill us. So not a good situation. They've got multiple outs here. Stone Skin Poison or Umber Arrow. They have Umber Arrow using the God Power. And going second for the fourth time out of five games is going to be the story of Fake Muse's Player of the Year tournament this year. A disappointing ending in a match full of mirrors. Got a huge steal in game number one going second. But not able to get any luck or RNG to break our way the rest of the match. And... It's how the cookie crumbles sometimes. And these matches, which are kind of flippy, you need you need to catch some breaks. And quite simply, we did not. Anyways, I uh, hope you enjoy the video. And see you the next time I see you.